I am, uh, I don't know how long it'll go. I feel like at least two weeks. But I want to, I want to start off a series this evening. I kind of, uh, the cup, first couple of days of the week, just kind of had something sort of chewing on me from Sunday night that I just couldn't quite get away from. So I, uh, I just, as the week went on, I, I felt led uh, to do this. We, we, spend, um, we spend a good amount of time on apostolic doctrine. We had, uh, when we, in the, in the days of ACS, we, uh, at times we had an elective that was, that was the title of the elective, Apostolic Doctrine. And at one point it was, it was a mandated elective for all church kids because we had kids that were, not in the school, that were not in the church that attended the school. And so we didn't mandate it for them, but it was a required elective. Brother, Brother Hughes done a lot of teaching on apostolic doctrine. And obviously apostolic doctrine is, is extremely important. And I, I don't know if I specifically use this term Sunday night, but in the context of a few things I, I said over the first couple of days of this week, I got to thinking about apostolic attitudes. Apostolic attitudes. And I think apostolic attitudes are just as important as apostolic doctrine. Now, I'm not talking about an attitude. That's part of the problem sometimes, is an apostolic attitude. I'm talking about apostolic attitudes. There's not a parent that probably hadn't at some point made the statement, don't give me that attitude. Sometimes apostolics need to be told that statement. And, and so here's, here's what I'm going to do starting this evening. I, I, I just started in the way I've approached this. This is not which the only thing that I ever get from something else. Usually I, some commentaries I share with you. I'm not copying this from somebody. I didn't read this someplace. This is what I feel like the Lord is giving me. And so the, the way I've approached this and what I'm doing is I've started at Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And as I'm reading, I'm thinking about the things that stand out to me that are, that are attitudes of the apostles. I realize most of you know this, but just for the sake of a starting point, I want to give you a definition for each of these two words, apostolic and attitudes. The word apostolic, according to Webster's Dictionary, means of or... Can you guys turn the screen on? Are we hooked up? Oh, sorry. I forgot the back and the front. Uh, my bad. <laughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> you guys are like, what are you talking about? that. See, it's grow. <laughs> Apostolic is of or relating to an apostle, or it's of relating to or conforming to the teachings of the New Testament apostles. And that's Webster's Dictionary, but I think that's very well said. Christianity.com says this about apostolic. Apostolic churches are a Christian denomination that arose from Pentecostal origins in the early 19th century. I would not agree with the term denomination, but again, I'm just reading. The name apostolic stemmed from the 12 apostles that followed Jesus, whose teachings are paramount for the beliefs of the, of the apostolic church. Apostolic members strive to promote first century Christianity in its faith, traditions, 
and politics with adherence to the doctrines of the Gospels. I, I don't, I'm not sure what it, what it is, but when I read that first part of that last sentence, apostolic members strive to promote first century Christianity. I, I really like that. We don't want 2020 Christianity. We don't want the 2000s version of Christianity. We want first century apostolic Christianity. And then the word, and I, I know neither of these words are, 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 are uh, uncommon. And we all have a sort of a working definition. But again, I just... I wanted it as a, as a starting point to just read these. So the, the word attitude, according to Collins Dictionary, your attitude to something is the way that you think and feel about it, especially when this shows in the way you behave. It is a manner of acting, feeling, or thinking that shows one's disposition opinions, etc., and it's one's disposition, opinion, mental set, etc. So we got to have a foundation of apostolic doctrine. That's our foundation. But we also need to have apostolic attitudes. I was, uh, I was killing a few minutes last night um, and was on, on YouTube and uh, over the last couple of weeks, one of my all-time favorite groups is um, the Gaither Vocal Band. And uh, Bill Gaither, if you've never heard of him, has written some uh, amazing songs through the years. Some of some songs we sing, he and his wife uh, wrote them. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Probably my favorite song. And so I, I've listened to the Bill Gaither Trio and then the Gaither Vocal Band all my life. And actually a week or so ago, I just I got to watching some of their videos on YouTube. And then so that was kind of in the, you know, the suggested. And I and then there's a comedian that sings with them. And I was watching a few minutes of of one of his clips. And and uh, he was. He was joking with the crowd. Um, he is a Baptist. He says that I'm a, everything I'm about to say is stuff basically he said. So I'm not trying to just call names. I'm, I'm quoting him. And, and uh, he, he talked about the fact as his uh, career, he was a singer with the Gaither Vocal Band for a long time. And um, he was raised Baptist and then as he got involved with the Gaither vocal band and uh, he, he, he said, I, I learned that uh, Presbyterians could go to heaven too, not, not just the Baptists. And, and then he, he kept on with some stuff and, and then he, he made, basically made the statement to this crowd, very large crowd in a large church building that, you know, Baptists and Presbyterians and Pentecostals and, and I think he named one or two others and, and he even threw Catholics in there. They're all going to heaven. Well, one of the things about us as apostolics that's different is that we don't believe everybody's just going to heaven with any different road is going to the same place. Don't believe the Bible says that. One of the things, and some of you have heard me talk about this at times through the years, but one of the things as I participated with a couple of different clergy settings in this county, a couple of two different ones, I won't give specifics, uh, but two different ones. One of the things that sort of became more and more disturbing in my spirit was as I sat around a group with a group of pastors of local churches of all denominations, some of them non-Christian denominations, that the attitude and the remarks and what you felt in that room was everybody at the table felt like your doctrine's okay, your doctrine's okay, your doctrine's okay, we're just all going to the same place. I'm not trying to be critical or judgmental, but that's not the Word of God that I read. And, and so here's the thing, the danger to me 
because of the way we as apostolics believe, there is a pitfall of having the wrong attitude. And there's probably not a person in this place that's been around the apostolic church for any length of time that you haven't at some point seen some of that attitude. The fact that we believe what we believe does not make us superior to everybody else. It does not make us better than other, everybody else. In fact, the bottom line is we're all here only by the grace of God. And the fact that we believe what we believe and know what we know is the grace of God. We didn't earn that. We didn't deserve that. So I, I, I know that our doctrine is absolutely important. But I think there's attitudes that are important as well. And so again, I, I just, I've read through, and I'm only going to cover a portion here this evening. And, and as I've read things that I felt like were, could be qualified as an attitude. So this is, this, is, this is sequential in the sense of as I went back through Acts, what came to mind. I'm not in any way saying this is, this is in importance. Um, and I do think maybe a few of these, if you were to prioritize them, um, maybe uh, at the end of the day, I think most of these are all pretty equally important. So the very first apostolic attitude that's demonstrated to me in the book of Acts is submission or obedience. This is an Acts, but this is the basis of this point. In Luke 24 and 49, Luke says, which Luke is the also, also the one used to write Acts, Luke says, Behold, Jesus speaking, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on, I, on high. And then Acts 1, verse number 9, the verses before this are red letters in your Bible. If you have a red letter edition and Jesus is, is saying some similar things as what I just read from Luke. And so this is the response. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he, as he, that while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, "Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven." shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey. They were submitted, they were obedient to the direction they had been given. It wasn't a matter of when Jesus ascended back into heaven and was now out of the picture. They said, hey, guys, well, let's, let's talk about this first. Do we really want to go back to Jerusalem? Do we really want to? Is that what we really want to do? I mean, hey, he's gone now. <laughs> but that wasn't the response. The response was he goes up into heaven. The angels say, why are you staying here? Why are you standing here? What are you waiting for? You were given instructions. And out of submission and obedience, they went. I, I, I don't think, and again, this is, this, is, this is just, hopefully not just me, but the Lord and I's approach to this. And the, and the way I've felt to, to go about this. But I, I think it's extremely significant that that, to me, the first thing you can see demonstrated, the first attitude is submission. Because submission is one of the absolute most key elements 
of a walk with God and especially of ministry. Really, there's no way to be saved without submission and obedience to the Word of God. But also, a huge part of ministry is submission. First and foremost, or submission and obedience. First and foremost, obedience and submission to God. But then those that God places in our lives as coverings under Him to help guide us and lead us. I, I, I think it's, I realize it's sort of simple, but I think it's also significant. There was no delay. Man, we, we've gotten in. I, I've had more, <laughs> I've had more, I don't, I don't really want to call them debates, because I don't think from, from my perspective of what a debate is, I really wouldn't quite call them that. But I, I, I've had more discussions over the last several months or so uh, of, of, of arguing opinions over things rather than a obedience, submission. And, and, and that's, again, I, I know I say, I feel like I say something along these lines frequently and I really am not trying to be critical or judgmental I really that's not my intent but but I feel like we've sort of in 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 Christianity and I mean that very broadly that really we have fostered this spirit of questioning and resisting and there because if you don't like it that's okay go across town Find another church. I, 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 don't, I look across this crowd this evening. I know most of you relatively well. I don't know of any of you that I would ever say have been church hoppers. So you don't know this, hopefully, but I've watched it. I, I, I used to, you know, in my younger years, <laughs> uh, when I first became co-pastor and leading Arnold and all that, somebody would come here, you know, from another church, maybe not necessarily an apostolic, but from another, some kind of other church, sometimes an apostolic church. And they come here and they had issues with the church they came from. Not really talking about doctrinal issues that, that were right or wrong. I'm just talking about their struggles over things or the way things were done and, and whatever. And they'd come here and, and, and all of a sudden this was the best thing in the world. And at first, when that would happen, I'm like, wow, check us out, man. We got it going on here. We're, we're better than so-and-so's church. It didn't take too long to realize if the motive they came was because they didn't like something there, they're about to leave at some point from here because they don't like something here. Again, I, I, I don't, you know, some of the circumstances that these, these, that the apostles and the other close followers of Jesus had just been through. I think it would have been easy for somebody to say, you know what, I, I, I just don't know if I feel like going to Jerusalem right now. I, I don't feel like I, you know, after all we've been through, I, I think we need a couple days off. I think we need a break. I don't think we need to go hang out in some room all of us together for days we need some alone time but there was obedience and submission to what God what Jesus had directly instructed them to do and I believe one of the most critical attitudes necessary attitudes of the apostolic church is submission and obedience the next attitude that I see demonstrated is the attitude that the final authority or, or is the final authority of the Word of God, both the Logos and the Rhema. That the, the, the thing that mattered was not opinion, wasn't, wasn't what others were saying, so let me give you the examples of, of what I mean by that. Acts 1, 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, 
The number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, watch this. The script, this scripture must needs been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of, his min of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field. With the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. That's such lovely verses there. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that the field is called in their proper tongue. Ac yeah, this, that is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have come... I don't know if y'all can see that up there, but I'm struggling seeing that on my iPad, and I can't blame anybody but me. So, Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So in, in verse number 16, Peter references David. In verse number uh, 20, again, another reference to the Psalms. Let, let, let's go to what the book says. Let's go to what the Word has said. What we are about to do needs to be based upon the Word of God. Amen. Not based on what the opinion of this group is. Not, not based on what the, the suggestions of this group is. We, we got here because of what the Scripture said, and we need to move forward based on what the Scripture said. I'm jumping ahead, but I, I just want to, for sake of, 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 of examples, Acts chapter 2, as Peter stands up to the, to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, he says, he lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I'm not going to try to explain this to you simply by my perspective. I, I'm not going to try to tell you the answer to your question by, based simply on the way that I see it. Let's go back to what the prophet said. Let's go back to what the word said. Acts 3.18, but those things which God beforehand had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Well, to me, part of what they're saying is, hey, let, let's not forget, we're not here by coincidence. We're not here by chance. God knew. We were told in his word. And I, I say Logos and Rhema because there was also things Jesus directly told them that they, that they took action based upon. There, there, there seems to be, again, a trend in, in, in Christianity today that there are things, there are, there are sources that are equally as important to us as the Word of God. That may be a book, that, that may be a, 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 an organization, that may be a, 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 a popular mindset or whatever, that, that that's what we go to. Let's, let's figure out what we should do based on that. That's not what we do. An apostolic attitude is the Word of God is the final authority in everything we do. The written Word of God and a rhema, a living Word of God, is also not only a final authority, but it's, it's the guide that we go by. It's what we hold on to in the midst of uncertainty. Again, verse 18, but, but those things which God beforehand showed them by the, by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Hey, hey guys, don't forget, 
what we've just seen the last couple of days, what, what we've just been through, we, we were told, again, not only did Jesus tell us, but the prophets foretold. I don't know, I don't know sometimes how much we as 2020 apostolics believe the Bible like we say we do. Oh, we, we, would, we, would, we would go to town arguing that, that oh, absolutely. I, I, are you kidding me? Don't you dare accuse me of not believing the Word of God. Really? If we believe it to the extent we do, why, why are we battle so much fear? Why do we battle so much torment? Come on. Why, why have we spent the last three months in all kinds of anxiety? Because have you read the back of the book? <laughs> have you read the outcome? The same way in which Peter says, hey, what we're experiencing right now was foretold by the prophets. It's the same thing for us today. I know it doesn't look good. I know it's uncertain times. I've never seen so much chaos in all my life in so many different areas. But at the end of the day, the Word of God gave us an insight that there was going to be some crazy things in the last days. And there was going to be some chaos. And there was going to be wars and rumors of wars. And there was going to be pestilence. And there was going to be all these things. But there's also some promises that says there's going to be a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. There, there's going to be a victorious church. And we're not just going to simply be crippled and hobbling out of here at the end. We are going to be victorious. I didn't say, I didn't say you. I said we. Sometimes I do the same thing. Looking at the news, I'm looking at the predictions of things in the future. Oh my God, what are we going to, what do you mean what are we going to do? If we'll just stay in the church. Amen. We'll just stay in the church. We don't have to worry about it because the church is not going down. The church is going up. Yeah. The next attitude that I find and I... I realize in some ways this could sound a little bit similar, but hopefully in a moment you'll, you'll get why I've separated this out from the previous, is the sovereignty of the Spirit of God. Acts 1, they are now in the process of replacing Judas. And so wa watch this process. Verse 23, and they appointed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether or which of these two you have chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The remaining eleven apostles did not just say, hey guys, we, we need to have a board meeting uh, next week. We have a vacancy on the apostolic board. We need to elect a new apostle. They didn't just get together and say, you know, Peter, what's your opinion? Who do you think? James, who do you think? John, who do you think? They didn't just sit and go around the table and come up with humanly inspired ideas. They said, God, we need direction. We need an answer. We want to do what you want us to do, not what our opinions or feelings are. John, no, Paul in Romans said it. Those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. 
We're not just going to make our own decisions here. We're, we're not just going to sit around and brainstorm. What's, what's the best way to do church? <laughs> what's the latest trend that we can do? What's, what's the latest idea going on in the church world that we can, we can adapt to fit? No, no. We need to know what the Spirit is saying. And that's not just an apostolic attitude for a corporate body. We as apostolics should have an individual apostolic attitude that says, God, your spirit is sovereign in my life. You tell me what you want me to do. You tell me how you want me to live. You tell me where you want me to go. You tell me what you want me to do. Not, you know what, I think I'm going this direction, so God bless it. I think I'm going to do this, so God, I hope you'll bless No. No. That's why you can't, we can't, and I, I feel like this ties in with these two, these two attitudes. You cannot compartmentalize your life into the secular and the spiritual, or the natural and the spiritual. I give God, you know, several times a week for church or a small group meeting or a life course or another ministry or something else. And, but then, then, then the rest of it's my life. I give God Sunday. Okay, God, you can have Sunday. I, I'll even kind of give you all my Sunday. I'll give you Sunday morning and I'll give you Sunday evening as well. But don't, don't bother me on Monday. And, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know that we consciously do that, per se, but I think a lot of people subconsciously do that. God's sovereignty is not just in the spiritual areas of my life. God's sovereignty is not just over how I worship. It's not just over the doctrine that I believe. God's sovereignty should be exercised in every aspect of my life. I, I sort of said it in a very vague way Sunday night, but I'm, I'm, I, it blows my mind. The, the lack of evidence to prove that walking away from God leads to a better life. I, I, would, I would not do it out of respect and, and whatever, but I, I could go down the list of person after person after person after person that at one point believed apostolic doctrine and then began to compromise and eventually walked away from God. I can go person after person after person after person whose lives are very easily seen to be in worse shape than they ever were when they were in the body of Christ. Amen. There, are a, there are a few, there are a few, but it is only a very small number of people that I could tell you that I've watched that they've lived that at one point they walked with God and believed the apostolic doctrine that walked away from it, that their lives from the surface, from I'm not talking from a spiritual perspective, but from a natural perspective, their lives are equally as good or better. There are a couple that from I could I could name that appear that way. But that other list, <laughs> that other list, divorce, addiction, etc., etc. What? I I I struggle understand. It, it's not rocket science. God running my life produces way better results than me running it. God in control of my life 
produce, I, I'm not even, ta uh, duh, salvation and eternity, but I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about here and now. God's word being the final authority and God's spirit having full control to run my life. The outcome of that, there's no comparison. And, 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 and we, we struggle being influenced by a 21st century mindset. Well, you, you know, you only got to do so much and you're going to get to heaven. There's only so little that's required and, 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 and you can be saved. The next apostolic attitude that I find demonstrated in Scripture is unity. Acts 2, 1, and then first, verse 44, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common. An apostolic attitude is the body of Christ. And, and I want to say it this way in the context of this evening. A congregation should have unity. We, we, we shouldn't have factions and parties in the church. Well, this group over here, we, we all identify with this kind of deal or whatever. And, and we're all about this over here. And, you know, they're the more conservatives and we're the more liberal. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about as far as scripture. They're, they're, they, they, they live more conservatively and we're a little. One body. One body. A unified body. Notice, please, it wasn't until they were in one accord that the Holy Ghost was poured out. I wonder if the reason they spent so many days before the Holy Ghost was poured out is because that's how long it took them to finally get into one mind and one accord. It's kind of like when we come together for church. We usually don't walk in here in one mind and one accord. There's usually a core group of people. Sometimes the worship team's in that group. Sometimes they're not. <laughs> There's a core group of people that enter his gates with thanksgiving. They enter his courts with praise. They were glad when somebody said to them, let's go to the house of the Lord. And they come in and that's their mindset and, 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 and they're ready to go. But then there's a whole nother group of people. Sometimes it's because of the weight of what's going on in their lives and they, they drag in or sometimes it's carnality and they drag in. And, but, but eventually... Eventually, Spirit of God begins to move and, and, and sort of person by person. I'm not sure we've ever really gotten 100% one mind and one accord, but I think we've had a high enough percentage that God's able to do something. <laughs> and so I, I, I just have a feeling. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody was in that in that group, those first couple, one of the other apostles is, was sitting there thinking, you know, I, I, Peter, why are you, I know he gave you the keys, but I don't know why you got to want to be the one to speak up here and lead the way. I don't know why you've always got to be the one taking charge. It, it may have took one of them a couple of days to finally go, you know what? This isn't about me. This isn't about my name. This is, this, is, this is sort of off topic, but I hadn't really thought about this yet, so I'll probably add this in the next week. <laughs> go, it's, if you've never done this, I want you to go home tonight or at some point in the next couple of days. And, and either, if, if you don't want to take the time to read through it verse by verse, if you've got a concordance, I want you to, I want you to type the word we. We. And I want you to read through the book of Acts. 
and see how many times you find that word we. Do you know that in the, in the book of Acts, in talking about the story of Paul's shipwreck, the writer says we were in that. What? I don't know about you, but all I've ever heard preached about was Paul being shipwrecked. Paul, Paul went, Paul, Paul, Paul. And yet, there's somebody writing this that says we. The we here never gets credit for being in shipwreck. The we in Acts never gets credit for being at the scene of some of these great miracles that took place. Who was the we? Luke. Can you imagine that? Luke. The, you read it. It's there. Luke went through some of the same things Paul went through, but never took credit for it. That's that. You want to talk about some unity. That's unity because that's an attitude that says it's not about who gets the credit. It's about the job getting done. It's not about whose name gets called. What an absolutely critical attitude. I, I, don't, I, I, would, I don't know. Maybe some of you thought all I'm just going to talk about is our attitude towards the world. That's, that's not all the apostolic attitudes there are. Oh, there are some that we need to work on, but that's, that's not the only ones. The next apostolic attitude I find is that the body of Christ is diverse. Right. Acts 2, 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Portus, or Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya out about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto to you and hearken unto my words. He didn't get up and say, um, sorry, we can't talk to all of you because you don't all come from where we come from. You're not all the same nationality as we are. You're, you're not all the same culture as we are. It wasn't, it wasn't the attitude of the early church. I'm going to say this again. I've said it many times. Others have said it many times as well. Every church ought to be a reflection of its community. Amen. I say it that way because there are certain places where the diversity in that area is, is not the same as in other places. <laughs> but I don't know of any one race community or city in this country, even if the minorities are very, very few. It's kind of sad how we think we're going to go to a diverse heaven from a non-diverse church. How are we going to go to a heaven with all tribes, kindreds, tongues, nations, and only go to church with one little clique of people. And the bottom line is that's not just about race. That's about economics. That's about education. 
what, what I forget which which one of the epistles it talks about when you know when when somebody walks in the door and you can tell they're rich and wealthy don't ask and don't escort them all the way to the front and then the person that doesn't look that way you just stick them off in the corner I think it's I think it's an important thing that not only do we demonstrate the diversity in the body of Christ of skin color. But we need to demonstrate it of all other aspects as well. We need those that got more degrees than a thermometer to sit down with other adults that didn't even finish high school and not look down, not treat them in any different way because they don't have the same level of education. And the one that doesn't have the education shouldn't feel intimidated to sit down with that one and converse with them. That's the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ. That's an apostolic attitude. None of us have a corner on the market in this. This one's a, I think this one's a big one. An apostolic attitude is that the church or the kingdom, it, or the, an apostolic attitude is a church or kingdom-centered life. And I put, I put the two terms there to make it clear. I'm not talking about a church-building-centered life. I'm talking about a church-centered life. This, this, this was the way they conducted themselves, Acts 2.46. They continually, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You know what, what always kind of makes me chuck a little bit? We spend all kinds of time emphasizing the temple and house to house. We spend all kinds of time. I, I do. I'm not saying I, I do. We spend all kinds of time emphasizing they met in the temple, they met in house to house. We never take time to talk about the fact it was daily. Come on. <laughs> daily is never the point. We just talk about where they met. Again, I, I've done. We, we need the we need the, the gather. We need the large corporate gatherings, and then we need small personal intimate gatherings. And we struggle to get that on a weekly basis. They did it daily. Well, their lives were different. Yeah, they 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 were. They didn't have fast food to go get when they were busy. They they didn't have the dry cleaners to drop their laundry off at. They didn't have washing machines. They. And it, something dawned on me years ago. Every generation is the busiest generation there's ever been. <laughs> the last generation thought they were so busy compared to the previous. So yeah, now we are the busiest. But it's kind of all relative because it's really, it's really not about our busyness. It's about our priorities. Hmm. Boy, I feel a little meddling coming on now. The issue is not our busyness. The issue is our priorities. I learned something a long time ago. One of the ways I learned part of this lesson was my time as principal at Antioch Christian School. That was one of the contributors. People always, you hear me, you may argue, you may argue with what I'm about to say, but I'm sorry, I've watched it for years now. People always have money for what they want money for. And they always have time for what they want time for. Yes. The same people that don't have enough time to come to church are the same people that have plenty of time to do what they want to do. It's not about busyness. It's about priorities. Yes. And the early church centered everything, or, or the church, the kingdom, was the center. It was the top priority. And they turned their world upside down. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It wasn't, it wasn't, let me see how I can fit the temple and how I can fit getting together with other believers in their houses. Let me see where I can fit that into my schedule. The attitude of the early church was, how do I fit my life into his schedule? And ultimately, I want my schedule to get lost. And I want it to be his schedule. Used to be families didn't miss church for their kids to play sports. Used to be people would turn down jobs because it interfered with church or ministry. Used to be that way. Oh, there are some that still do that, but I've also watched more and more of people allow, not just allow, but make willful choices to do things that they know is going to be a conflict with their church slash kingdom involvement. An apostolic attitude is not, I'll fit God in when it's convenient. An apostolic attitude is, God is number one. God takes precedence over everything else. Again, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe when I first started, you, you just thought the only thing apostolic attitude-wise is how we treat the world. There's way more to our apostolic attitude than how we treat the world. I'm going to, I got a couple more, but I'm going to probably wrap it up. Well, I'll wrap it up either way, but Acts 3, 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Devotion is an apostolic attitude. A life of devotion. And I mean both public and private devotion. They were dedicated and committed. Some ways, maybe you could just say this is a continuation of the previous attitude of the church, kingdom being, life being centered around that. They went up to the ninth, at the ninth hour to pray because that was a part of their life. It wasn't an extracurricular activity. It wasn't a take it or leave it thing. It was a major priority. The last one I have, and I'll just go ahead and cover it, and we'll wind up here. An apostolic attitude is compassion. Acts 3, 2, And a certain man, verse we just read, verse 1, they're on their way to the temple, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. An apostolic attitude is not, well, I'm on my way to church. I, I'm on my way to this. I'm on my way to that. I can't stop. An apostolic attitude is an attitude of compassion that I see somebody in need and I've got time to minister to that need. 
I recognize those that are struggling. I recognize those that are hurting. And I've, I've got time. I'm willing to go out of my way. I'm, I'm willing to interrupt my schedule, my priorities. Willing to do that. Willing to recognize and be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. I, I understand, I believe, most of us, most of you that are watching, I, I, not, in, not here tonight teaching and implying we or you or I don't have all of these. I'm just, I'm just telling you these are things that should be. Not just one God, baptism in Jesus' name, speaking in tongues, living a holy life. That, that's all important. It's all important. But our mindset, our opinions, our conduct based on our attitude is as equally as important. I was in a conversation earlier today with, with someone... And they were they were sharing uh, about where they go to church and it's an apostolic church and the process that someone has to go through to get baptized. And, and one of the things and I'm not trying to be unethical or whatever by sharing this, that's why I'm not trying to give any indicator of who it might be or where it may be said that they've actually brought people to church to get baptized and and a part of this process they'll stand in front of everybody and and they'll tell them what's got to change you know you won't be able to do this anymore you know you won't be able to wear that anymore i'm sorry your doctrine may be right that's not an apostolic attitude in fact, there's, there's a couple of them, at least one of them we'll get to, Lord willing, in the next week or two that I think pretty clearly demonstrates that. Let it not be said of this congregation. Can't speak for the rest of the world, but my burden and prayer, let it not be said of this congregation that our attitudes contradict our apostolic doctrine. But God give us an apostolic or give us apostolic attitudes that complement our apostolic doctrine. In fact, would you just join me and as we close, could we make that our prayer this evening? Father, most of us don't seem to struggle very much with the doctrine. We stand on the principles of baptism and one God and infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in tongues, a life of separation and all of that. We, we stand on that firmly, but we don't always have the attitude part right. I pray, God, that the attitudes, the mindset that we can find demonstrated throughout the book of Acts that would that would be the attitudes that would rule and reign in us. That would be the attitudes that would be manifested through us in this congregation, Lord. In this congregation, God, let those attitudes be present. Let them be manifested. Let them be the attitudes that govern our actions, our attitudes, our spirit, our conduct. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, don't let it ever be that our attitudes become the stumbling block to our doctrine. Don't let it ever be that our attitudes become the hindrance to someone embracing the apostolic doctrine, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen.